The question I always ask myself, just like I think any human being, is who am I and why do I exist? And who are we as humans and why do we exist? Uh, when I was in college, I had a much more naive view. Uh, I was very much into computers, artificial intelligence, and I thought it must be the case that uh, I'm destined to work on some computer algorithms along with my colleagues, figure out how the brain works and how the computer can be as smart as the brain, perhaps become a substitute of the brain, and that's what artificial intelligence is about. So that was the simplistic view that I had, and I pursued that in my college, in my graduate years. Uh, I, went, I went to Carnegie Mellon, got a PhD in speech recognition, went to Apple, uh, SGI, Microsoft, Google, in each of the com companies continuing to work on artificial intelligence, uh, be thinking that was the pursuit of how intelligence worked and that our elucidation of artificial intelligence would then come back and tell us, ah, that's how the brain works, we replicated it, so that's, that's what intelligence is about and that must be the most important thing uh, in our lives, that, that is our IQ, our ability to think, analyze, predict, understand, all that stuff should be ex explicable by replicating it in a computer. Uh, I've had the good fortune to uh, have met uh, Professor Minsky, uh, Professor Alan Newell, Professor Herb Simon, and my mentor, Professor Raj Reddy. All of these people uh, had profound influence on the way I thought, and, and I think it's consistent that they were too pursuing the understanding of intelligence. And the belief at one point was that we would take the human intelligence and implement it as rules as, uh, that, that would have a way to act as people if we told them the steps in which we go through our thoughts. Uh, for example, uh, if I'm hungry, then I want to go out and eat. If I have used a lot of money this month, I will go to a cheaper place. A cheaper place implies McDonald's. At McDonald's, I avoid fried foods, so I just get a hamburger. So that if then else is the way we, re we think we reason. And that's how the first generation of um, so-called expert systems or symbolic AI proceeded. Uh, I went on to learn that and I found that um, it was very limiting because when we r write down the rules, there were just too many. Uh, there was a, uh, a professor at uh, MCC, his name was uh, uh, Doug Lennett, one of the smartest people I know. He proceeded to hire uh, hundreds of people to write down all the rules that we can think of, thinking that one way will be done and that will be the brain. Um, and at Apple, Microsoft funded his research, he wrote down all the detailed rules. I remember visiting him, he was showing me all these variants of uh, flowers and understanding of what type of a flower this was and which flowers had how many petals, what colors. And it just turns out, I think the knowledge in the world was too much to possibly enter and their interactions were too complex and the rule-based systems, that engine, we really didn't know how to build it. So that was the first wave. People got excited, thinking we could write rules, and that completely failed, resulting in only maybe a handful of somewhat useful applications. And that really led everybody to believe uh, AI was doomed and this was not worth pursuing. I was fortunate to have been with the second wave, and that was uh, my PhD work at Carnegie Mellon. And the work was what if we used some kind of statistics or machine learning? What if we collected samples of uh, things and trained the system? So samples of speech to train the different sounds of English, samples of dogs and cats to train recognition of animals, and those resulted in pretty good results at the time. And my technology used in my PhD thesis was called Hidden Markov Models. It was the first example of speaker-independent speech recognition system, which uh, was uh, used and is still in many of the products. If you use uh, Siri or the Microsoft speech recognizer, there's still hints of the work that I did uh, carried over by people who licensed the work or work on the team. Um, and these technologies were used in computer vision, computer speech, and I did that work at uh, Carnegie Mellon in, in the 80s and I uh, got, got my thesis in 88 
and I continued to work at Apple uh, from 90 to 96, and, and then at Microsoft Research, which I joined uh, shortly afterwards for in the, around the year to 2000. So, so the work on that continued, but it really, uh, we were optimistic that extrapolation of this work should work because we saw results improving. But, but after a decade of work, we kind of saw the significant improvements were reaching an asymptote. It wasn't going up any higher. We were frustrated. And again, a number of people came and said, well, you can recognize a thousand words, you can recognize a hundred objects, but uh, this is not extensible. Human can understand you know, infinite vocabulary, even new words that are made up. This is not smart, this is not AI. And that came the second crash of artificial intelligence. And uh, it, it, it didn't really demonstrate um, that machines were able to do what humans can do. Yeah, so, so in the first wave, I've also had the good luck of working, uh, getting to know Professor Roger Shank, and in fact, one of his students was my, one of my advisors in my undergrad years. But those were the experiments that led me to believe that expert systems could not scale, and in fact, could never scale. And in fact, that our brains probably didn't work the way we thought they work. That we, we in order to simplify our articulation of our decision process, we used uh, if then else as a language that people understood, but our brains actually were much more complex than that. In the second wave, in my thesis and PhD, uh, and that was a period when I uh, certainly read about Professor Judea Pearl's work. I was very much influenced by a number of uh, top scientists at uh, IBM, um, Dr. Fred Jelinek, um, Peter Brown, Bob Mercer, um, they really made the market in, uh, in making statistical approaches become the mainstream, not only for speech, but also for machine translation, to whom I owe a lot of gratitude. Um, but still, we, we got stuck. But this time, I think it's funny because we got stuck, not because the technologies were wrong, I think the statistical approaches were exactly right. In fact, uh, at Carnegie Mellon, I worked on hidden Markov models, uh, right across the, uh, the corridor, Jeff Hinton was work on, working on neural networks. And the variant of his neural network at the time, which he called time-delayed neural networks, arguably, um, and, and that was in the um, late 80s, arguably that was the first version of convolutional uh, neural networks, which is now the talk of the town and the deep learning taking over the world. Uh, it was actually um, inspired and invented back in the 80s. But one, why did, why did uh, that wave of statistic, statistical and neural net based machine learning not take off? Um, in retrospect, it had nothing to do with technology. Most of the technology was already invented. The problem was we just had way little, too little training data. So our brains actually work completely different, differently from the way these deep learning machines work. In order for deep learning machines to work, you have to give it um, many orders of magnitude more training data than humans are used to. Humans can see maybe uh, you know, tens or hundreds of faces and start to recognize people, but these deep learning neural networks would love to see billions before becoming really good. Um, of course, once they become really good, they're better than people. So that is the caveat, is that um, Back in the 80s and 90s, we simply didn't have enough training data, nor did we have enough compute power to push these uh, almost discovered technologies to the extreme. Yeah, so the, Google was the company that really began to realize, in order to do search, you needed a lot of machines. You needed them to be parallel. And then Jeff Dean and other people at Google found that once you had those parallel machines, you could do more than search. You could build AI on top of that. Then they found, well, to do AI, you really needed specialized chips to really make to do those well. Uh, then came NVIDIA's GPUs, and then Google did its own TPUs. So it's all an interesting progression. A um, little bit of a for, uh, fortuitous um, uh, incident that Google chose to do search and search needed servers and they had Jeff Dean that evolved to, evolved to today's architecture of massively parallel um, GPU or TPU based learning that can learn uh, from a lot more data from a single domain. 
Uh, so new technologies developed based on this massively par parallel machine learning architecture uh, built on uh, GPUs and new, new accelerators. So more and more people were able to train uh, face recognizers, uh, speech recognizers, image recognizers, and, you, and also apply AI to search and prediction. Lots of internet data came about. Amazon uses it to help predict what you might want to buy. Uh, Google uses it to predict what ad you might want to click on and, um, and, and, um, and potentially spend money. And um, uh, Microsoft uses it. And in China, we have Tencent, Alibaba, and many, many applications are coming about based on the huge amount of internet data. So uh, at the same time, technologies were progressing. Uh, Jeff Hinton, uh, Jan LeCun, and Yashua Bengio were the three people who continued to work on neural networks, even though in the early 2000s, they were kind of um, uh, not in the mainstream anymore. Uh, in, the, in the 80s, that was a novelty. Some breakthrough statistical work then looked like those didn't scale. The funding agency abandoned them. Uh, conferences stopped accepting their papers, but these three professors kept at it with small amounts of funding to uh, refine and develop better algorithms, and then more data came along, and then they found that actually their new algorithms, uh, sometimes called uh, convolution neural networks, called deep learning, uh, and also vari some variants um, of, of, of the work related perhaps to um, reinforcement training, uh, transfer learning, these set of technologies um, emanated from these three professors began to blossom in the industry. Uh, speech recognition systems were built by top companies that are beating human performance, face recognition companies the same, image recognition, and that has e-commerce implications, speaker user identification, uh, it was applied to internet data, higher prediction for Amazon making more money in the process, uh, better predictions for uh, Facebook in terms of how to rank your news feed, uh, better search results from Google, so this was getting broad adoption. Uh, deep neural networks were uh, used in, started to get used in Google in the late 2000s, and in the last uh, seven or eight years, it blossomed to reach almost everywhere. Um, architectures were coming out, uh, more intelligent systems were being developed. Of course, the event that ignited the whole world was AlphaGo uh, by uh, beating uh, Lee, uh, Master Li from uh, Korea and then uh, Master Ke from uh, China by increasingly large gaps, and more recently coming out with a paper that said <clears throat> AlphaGo could be trained with no human knowledge from scratch. These are all breakthroughs that uh, uh, caused the whole world to begin to know this, wow, this time AI is for real. Um, actually, we had something in the second wave. The neural nets and statistical approaches were right. We just didn't have enough data, enough um, uh, compute power, and enough uh, uh, advancements of the technologies at the time to make it happen, but now we do. So, uh, so AI is taking off everywhere, um, and there, there were new schools of thoughts that came about. Uh, one set of people started to uh, project back at our original question, who are we and why we exist? And, and these people make the extrapolation that because AlphaGo was able to improve itself uh, exponentially uh, over the past two, three years, if we push that to other domains, we're going to have uh, uh, machines that will be super intelligent that could either be plugged into our heads and become our human augmentation, or they'll be evil and take over mankind. So I've, I want to just uh, shut down that uh, train of thought, that's just inaccurate, um, because today's AI, as advanced as it is, as much as AI is uh, doing a phenomenal job beating humans in playing games, speech recognition, face recognition, and then later autonomous vehicles, industrial robots, yes, these will all happen, but these are going to be limited in the following ways. Uh, the, today's AI, which we call weak AI, is really an optimizer an optimizer based on a lot of data in one domain that they learn to do one thing extremely well. So it's a very vertical, single task 
a robot, if you will, but it does only one thing. You cannot teach it many things. You cannot teach it multi-domain. Um, you cannot teach it to have common sense. Uh, you cannot give it emotion, and it has no self-awareness, and therefore no desire or even understanding of how to love or dominate a human being. So all the dystopia talk, I think, is uh, just nonsense. Uh, it's too much imagination. Uh, we're seeing AI going into new applications in what appears to be an exponential growth, but what that really is, is an exponential growth of applications of the mature technologies that exist. And that growth will be over once we develop all of them. And then we have to wait for more breakthroughs for further uh, advancement of AI. But you cannot predict uh, further advancements. You know, if you look at the history of AI, uh, the deep learning type of innovation really just happened one time. So this is once out of, uh, since 1957 till today, this is um, one time out of 60, um, sorry, one time out of, yeah, one time out of 60 years that we have one breakthrough. You cannot go ahead and predict that we're going to have a breakthrough next year, and then the month after that, then the day after that. That would be exponential. Exponential adoption of applications is for now happening, and that's great. But exponential inventions is a ridiculous concept. So the people who make those claims and who claim singularity is ahead of us, uh, I think that's just based on absolutely no engineering reality. Today's AI only does one task at a time, and it's great as a tool, it's great to add value, it's great at creating value. It will replace many of humans' job tasks and some of human jobs. That is really what we should think about and not about this uh, grand, strong AI where the machine is like human and can reason cross domains and have common sense. That is um, uh, not at all predictable from today's progress. Um, might it happen someday, a hundred or a thousand years from now? I suppose anything's possible, but I think we should probably focus our energy on what is here today. What's here today is the super optimizers that can do a better job than human in picking stocks, in making loans, in doing customer support, in doing telemarketing, in doing um, assembly line work, in doing assistance work, in doing broker's work, doing paralegal work, and better than humans. And, and they're taking those over and freeing human time and letting us do what we really love and what we do best. I think that's the opportunity of a lifetime, not this dystopia of computers becoming super intelligent. Yeah. So I'm currently working on venture capital. We're working with startup companies. And we think um, we see a lot of progress in the results by just taking the already well-proven algorithms and applying them to real-world problems. So I think we're now at an age of uh, really uh, all the fruit trees have blossomed. There are so many low-hanging fruits. I think that we should maximize our opportunity by taking each one to create value. Um, we don't really need, uh, in order to create value, we don't yet need new advances in science. So I think the scientists should go off and invent the next uh, better than deep learning algorithm. And we in the product entrepreneurial venture space should maximize value. And that value is tremendous because it, is, uh, it will eventually replace all of our routine tasks and do, do so better than people and creating so much value for the society. Yeah, there have been a number of studies. I think you can look at um, uh, McKinsey and Goldman Sachs and PwC. They've all talked about AI as today's technology without new inventions applied to finance, hospital, government, um, uh, and, and education and all kinds of areas in creating a lot of value because we'll be able to do many of the historical things much better than, than we do. And that there is uh, basically, uh, of the algorithm running on just electricity will do outdo people in all of these tasks. So whether you look at it as a um, uh, increasing the value chain or replacing the human routine work, uh, the amount of value is tremendous. These companies are predicting, you know, 15, 20, 30 trillion dollars of value in the next 10 to 15 years. So I think that makes it a very exciting area to, um, to do investment, to do entrepreneurship. But I think we need to come back and think about, okay, suppose we build this really smart paralegal system, the system that can write 
better than the reporters for short articles or this um, loan officer uh, rep uh, uh, replacement program or the assembly line or the receptionist and so on. Well, what happens to the people who are in those jobs? I think in an abstract world, if we were to reconstruct reconstruct world from the scratch, we I think we'd be very happy human beings because we'd have machines do these um, repetitive and routine tasks. We can then elevate ourselves to uh, to be uh, thinking, inventing, creating, uh, socializing, having fun, getting hobbies. It would be an amazing life. But I think we're all going to face a very challenging next 15 or 20 years when half of the jobs are going to be replaced by humans, uh, by, by machines. And humans have never seen the scale of massive job, this decimation. Uh, industrial revolution took a lot longer. Uh, and the industrial revolution created jobs while it uh, replaced uh, jobs. So when it took artisans, um, you know, months, a few artisans months to create a car, an automobile, and the assembly line allowed that to happen in a fraction of the time by dividing the work into little chunks. Um, some jobs disappeared, many jobs were created, car prices came down, and then um, the, job, the job employment rate actually went up. But artificial intelligence is different because when we make a loan officer um, that decides whether to give someone a loan or not based on purely quantitative information, that loan officer will be better than 99% of all loan officers out there. So, and they, they will be replaced outright because it is a simple, single domain optimization problem, feed everything we know about the person in, and out comes the likelihood of repayment versus default. That rate is a quantitative computation based on a huge amount of data that no human can possibly match. So the people in those jobs will be out of jobs and have to do something else. Same with security, with paralegal, with accounting, and um, uh, even with uh, reporters and translators. I mean, we're seeing um, speech-to-speech -speech translation uh, work as well as amateur translators now. Not yet at a professional level, but good enough for travel. Yeah, it's possible eventually um, we don't have to learn foreign languages because we'll just have a little earpiece that translates what other people uh, say. So you know, there's wonderful addition in convenience, productivity, value creation, saving time, but at the same time we have to be cognizant that translators will be out of jobs. Yeah, when we think about the Industrial Revolution, I think looking back, we, we see it as having done a lot of good, created a lot of jobs, but the process was, was painful and some of the tactics were questionable and we're going to see all those issues come up again and even worse in the AI revolution. Uh, in the Industrial Revolution, many people were in fact replaced and displaced and their jobs were gone and they were, had to live in destitute although the overall employment and the wealth was created, but it was made by a small number of people. Fortunately, Industrial Revolution lasted a long time, so this was gradual, and then governments could deal with uh, one group at a time whose jobs were de being displaced. Um, and also, during the Industrial Revolution, a certain work ethic was uh, perpetuated that that I think the capitalists wanted the worst of the world to believe that if I worked hard, even if it's a routine repetitive job, I will get compensated, I will have a certain degree of wealth, and that will give me dignity and self-actualization. That people say, well, he works hard, he has a house, he's a good citizen of the society. Uh, that surely isn't how we want to be remembered as mankind. Um, I think, uh, and also that, but at the same time, that is how most people on Earth believe in their current um, existence. And that's extremely dangerous to have now because AI is going to be taking most of those jobs that are routine and repetitive. And, and it's not just an issue of, um, of uh, some people losing jobs and not getting a salary. Um, that potentially could be taken care of with UBI or some sort of income scheme. Um, but the issue is the, the people losing the jobs used to feel their reason for existence as uh, work ethic, working hard, getting that house, providing for the family. Yeah. I, th I think you know, repetitive work to the extent that you like to, 
to do photography or calligraphy. Uh, you can repeatedly do it and you think every piece is a little bit different. You enjoy it, you're growing, you're getting calmness, you're growing as a person, that's all fine. Uh, but if you put someone uh, you know, in front of a, um, a restaurant, in, a, in the back room of a restaurant, and all you do is cut onions all day. Or if you put someone in the factory, all you do is screw iPhones together. Um, or if you are a um, um, junior accountant, all you do is check for uh, the numbers in the books. Uh, those jobs are not really giving you enrichment. Um, they're not different, they're not interesting, they're not advancing you as a human being. And for the Industrial Revolution, uh, uh, people who benefited from the Industrial Revolution, it's to their advantage that most of the world thought that way, that then they can get hardworking people to grow their, their pocketbooks, their wealth. Yeah, so this whole advancement of artificial intelligence got me to rethinking, well, what is the reason I started on this journey? It was really to figure out how our brain worked. And it wasn't through expert system, it wasn't through neural networks and now deep learning. Does that really at all answer the question? So I have just recently realized that this journey partly has been tremendously successful. We're about to see deep learning create uh, tens of trillions of dollars of wealth for mankind. We're about to see many routine jobs being replaced so we have more free time on our hands. But at the same time, uh, this deep learning has nothing to do with the way our brain works. You know, we have love, we have emotion, we have self-awareness. Our DNA is um, uh, iterated over the billions of years to provide for our survival on this planet. And, and, and all of the things that makes us human uh, has nothing to do with these so-called AI. And when we say narrow AI, uh, the AI that's optimizing, that's really all it is. It is a machine, it is a tool. Even if it's driving us around in an autonomous vehicle, it is not intelligently thinking, and it, it is not at all um, uh, able to reason with common sense. Yeah, I think even artificial intelligence is somewhat of a misnomer because when we think of intelligence, there are many types of things that, that aggregate to, to, to cause us to think someone is intelligent. If someone does only one thing extremely well, do we really call that person intelligence? If they can't explain why they did what they did, uh, other than knowing the most probable stock to buy today is this stock, that all they know is we should not loan this person money because the default likelihood is 23%. Is that really intelligent? I, I don't think so. So I think we come back to realize that my original dream of finding why, who we are and why we exist ended up in a failure that even though we invented all these wonderful tools and they will uh, be great for our future, for our kids, for our society, we have not really figured out how, why humans exist. But what is interesting though for me is that uh, in understanding that these AI tools are doing uh, repetitive tasks, it certainly comes back to tell us that, well, doing repetitive tasks can't be what makes us humans and that AI's arrival will at least remove what cannot be our reason for existence on this earth. If that's half of our job tasks, then that's half of our time back to thinking about why we exist. And I think um, certainly one very valid reason for existing is we are here to create. You know, what AI cannot do are perhaps potential reasons of why we exist. I think one such direction is that we create we invent things, we celebrate creation, we're very creative about scientific process, curing diseases, creative about writing books, writing movies, creative about telling stories, doing a brilliant job in marketing. Uh, the, these are all creativity we should celebrate and that's perhaps what makes us human. I think another angle of what AI cannot do is love. Uh, we love each other, we truly connect with people, we want to help people. By helping people, we get a sense of self-worth and dignity and self-actualization. So it also suggests that um, perhaps it is the ability to create and the um, ability to love are the more reasons of why we exist. So, so I think AI has gone all the way around to teach me that our brain is too hard to understand. 
it is not just a piece of the organ, it's our whole body and our whole way of thinking, it's our whole evolution. And what AI has done is maybe come back and said, hey, Kaifu, maybe you and the mankind have been fooled by industrial revolution into thinking doing repetitive tasks can possibly be a reason for your existence. Well, if you think that way, think no longer because AI is taking all those jobs away. So think again. So only what AI cannot do can possibly be a reason for your existence. And it is perhaps about creativity, it is perhaps about love, it is perhaps something else, but it sure isn't the routine jobs. And that, I think, has uh, really uh, a stricken home for me to realize that I was naively pursuing replicating the human brain and not at all accomplishing that purpose. Um, the people who work with us accomplish great tools called AI that can solve problems and make money and remove drudgery from our lives. But I think we have to go back to square one and think about, okay, what, who are we? Are we here to create, to love, or is it something else? Um, well, I, I think if we look at the history of computing, uh, we started by connecting people to information on one computer. Then the internet connected all the computers together. Then we were able to access more information. Uh, they weren't easy to find, so search engine helped us find them. And then we wanted to be beyond information. Then social network connected us with each other. And then we wanted to connect uh, anytime, anywhere. Then mobile allowed us to connect with people and information anywhere. And that's kind of where we are. But we can see a number of major additional enhancements coming. Uh, in China, for example, uh, payment is instantaneous, uh, frictionless micropayment, peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. So anybody can pay anybody. And that will become another platform for innovation. And I think those types of things will continue to grow. And our network of people-to-people, -people, people to information, and then payment and access and, and uh, data will get more accumulated. And then AI will go in and make uh, very intelligent recommendations. You know, in the future, you know, the, the system will work as a whole with, with people and machines. Right? IoT will be the next step that connects devices together. IoT has been talked about for a long time. They really haven't yet taken off, but because uh, I think in the short, uh, near, near term, we can already anticipate smart microphones and video cameras can aggregate the content and make very intelligent predictions about traffic, about people, about what they want. Imagine you know, when we're online, we, our cookie tells the Amazon what we looked at, what we bought, and what we didn't buy. And that's used to feed Amazon's intelligence about what to recommend and sell to us. In the, not, in the, in the already, not even future, today already, there are stores, Amazon Go here, and there are stores in China uh, that have cameras that will know who has entered the room, who has picked up what product, who has bought what product, and those will come back to become a very powerful profile that integrates online, offline. So essentially, we're looking to a future where everything about us, online and offline, will become profiles, will be used to give us convenience. It will be the fine, next big step towards trading privacy for convenience. Uh, some people won't be comfortable with it, but it's a eventuality that probably cannot be avoided. Uh, social networks, I think, will uh, also grow to be more uh, uh, real name, tractable, and accountable, and also the data from it will generate a lot of value. So I, I think all of this is going towards uh, people and devices getting connected, um, data being extracted to create intelligence. That intelligence will deliver convenience and value to the user, um, and, and this is at the expense of those of us who want that convenience will need to trade our privacy. Um, and, and this is an interesting qu question, but I don't think most people can really say no to it. As we, as we think about all the benefits from AI, there are a number of issues one needs to be concerned about. Uh, one issue, as I talked about, was the job losses and how to deal with that. Uh, another issue is the haves and have-nots. Uh, the people who are 
inventing these AI algorithms, building AI companies, will become the haves. The people whose jobs are replaced will be the what have nots. And the gap between them, whether it's in wealth or power, will be dramatic and will be perhaps the largest that mankind has ever experienced. Uh, similarly, the companies that have AI and the companies that are traditional and slow to shift will have large gaps as well. And, and lastly, and perhaps most difficult to solve, is the gap between countries. The countries that have a AI technology will be much better off. They'll be creating, extrapolating value, uh, extra extracting value. Uh, the countries that have large population of users whose data is gathered and iterated through the AI algorithm, they'll be in good shape. So US is in good shape. China is in good shape. Uh, the countries that are not in good shape are the countries that have um, um, perhaps a large population, but no AI, no technologies, no Google, no Tencent, no Baidu, no um, Alibaba, no Facebook, no Amazon. So these people will basically be data points to countries whose uh, software are dominant in their country. Right? So if, it, if, if a, 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 a country in Africa uses largely Facebook and Google, they will be um, providing their data to help Facebook and Google make more money. Okay. But their jobs will still be replaced nevertheless. So think about a situation where in US or China, uh, all the AI companies will take all the data and make so much money. And then there will be people displaced, but potentially we can imagine the government redistributing that uh, wealth from the people who made it, uh, perhaps as a tax, and then distributing to those who have not, perhaps as UBI or some variant. So I think US and China are okay. But think about another country, uh, they have only the displaced and not the creative, or mostly the displaced and very few valuable companies. And where will the tax B, to take the money to give to the displaced. Um, that's the big issue. Okay, so with US and China being very powerful in terms of their AI technologies, the companies that benefit from the data, and having a lot of data from their own countries and other countries, uh, they will be very well off. Other countries, I think, will be in a very difficult position. We're seeing uh, Europe, I think, put into some challenge based on this issue. and their choice of response was to put uh, American companies uh, uh, on antitrust and other issues to, as its way to collect money from them. That surely is not a sus sustainable approach. There will be poorer countries in developing and underdeveloped world uh, who will have, who used to have perhaps a, an ambition and an aspiration that they will too be like China using lower cost labor to win business in manufacturing and eventually getting to the developed uh, country um, path. But that dream is probably no longer feasible because AI and robots are the ones making the new machines. So the low cost labor in a country that may have propelled China from a poor country to a relatively wealthy country, that formula is no longer available because AI and robots will be doing the manufacturing and the, the labor work. So the large population that, gave, that was China's asset to, to its rise will become a liability to many countries. The larger the population, perhaps the worse off you are, unless that population has a significant enough percentage that cre can create value, can build AI, can build companies, and can make money. So this global geopolitical um, future is uh, very worrisome because you might have uh, some countries having no choice but to become a, a vassal state to US or China. Basically, you got my data, uh, I will do what you want and you uh, uh, help me feed the poor people. That would be one uh, very uh, direct way to describe a very uh, worrisome um, uh, outcome. Another outcome might be um, the state becomes uh, uh, unable to manage the poverty and the restlessness in the country so that another, um, uh, e either a um, country with a lot of distress uh, can happen or may maybe it will be anarchy or maybe it will be another North Korea uh, because you can imagine uh, when the country is all desperate seeing no future of creating wealth being left behind um, that's very, very worrisome. 
Um, the, one could be optimistic and naive and say, well, hopefully someday there will be a world government because there is enough money to go around. But historically, looking at all that, all the foolish things that we have done as mankind, I have very little hope that's going to happen. But these are issues I think we need to bring up uh, in dealing with the haves and have-nots in the widening gap of, the, of countries and of people. Um, I don't certainly have the solutions, but I think we as a mankind, if we want to come back to the question of why we exist, I think we at this point can say we certainly don't exist to do routine work. We perhaps exist to create. We perhaps exist to love. And if we really want to create, let's create new types of uh, jobs that people can be employed in. Let's create new ways in which countries can work together. And let, if we think we exist to love, let's first think how we can love the people who will be disadvantaged.